Welcome to this morning's American Security Project webinar. This is an on the record conversation that will be available for attribution. A recording of this conversation will be posted on our website. All audience members will be muted during the discussion, but please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions to the panelists. With that, Patrick, over to you. Thank you, Tucker. Uh, good morning from Washington. I'm Patrick Costello, the CEO of the American Security Project. Welcome to today's virtual conversation. Russia's aggressive war in Ukraine has roiled international energy markets where it's a major player. It's one of the world's top three crude producers vying for the top spot with Saudi Arabia and the United States. Russia relies heavily on revenues from oil and natural gas, which in 2021 made up nearly half of Russia's federal budget. Russia is also the world's second largest producer of natural gas behind the United States and is the world's largest gas reserves. The invasion of Ukraine and the EU's dependence on Russian natural gas show that a diversification of energy supplies is critical to establishing energy security. This crisis has forced conversation on energy security and policymakers have to balance the energy trilemma, sustainability, security, and affordability. Joining us today to discuss the implications of Russia's invasion on Ukraine on global energy security, the climate agenda, and global energy markets are two friends of the American Security Project, Kevin Book and Mark Nevitt. Kevin heads the research team and covers oil, gas, and coal policy at Clearview Energy Partners, which is an independent firm that examines macro energy issues for international investors and corporate strategists. Kevin is an authoritative voice on the subject of energy and energy policy. He appears frequently in print and in broadcast media, contributes to policy forums convened by governments, think tanks, and private organizations, and meets quite regularly with Washington's top decision makers. He also has testified on the Hill before the House and Senate on a number of occasions. Commander Mark Nevitt recently joined Emory Law School faculty as an associate professor of law, having previously been affiliated with Syracuse University's College of Law. He was a distinguished professor of leadership in law at the Naval Academy in Annapolis and has taught climate change law and policy in a seminar on national security law and society at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Before academia, uh, Commander Nevitt <clears throat> served as both a tactical jet aviator and attorney in the United States Navy serving in the rank of commander and as a White House military social aide. As Navy JAG, uh, Nevitt served as an environmental attorney, a criminal defense attorney, as well as an ethics attorney. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. To the guests on the line throughout this morning's conversation, please feel free to use the chat function and Q&A functions to submit your inquiries. I'll weave them in where appropriate. And if you'd like to be identified with your affiliation, please provide that as well. So let's get started. It seems to me that the COVID lockdowns began to ease last fall and economies rebounded, demand for oil and gas bounced back. Uh, the strong demand set the stage for a significant challenge, some call it a crisis, for global energy and prices for natural gas, coal and oil spiked. We then have Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February, which turned an energy and economic challenge into a real geopolitical crisis, uh, driving prices up even further. The optimist in me says that there's an opportunity in this crisis. Europe is rethinking energy sources and energy partners. Mark, you've written that climate mitigation efforts are pressuring all nations to unshackle their respective economies from fossil fuel usage. So we could see an acceleration of decarbonization trends. But the pessimist in me recognizes that this has been a stark reminder that the world needs oil, gas, and coal for 80% of its energy needs, and there are loud calls to increase oil production. Uh, just yesterday, former Energy Secretary Ernie Moniz wrote in the Boston Globe that Russia's war in Ukraine has amplified an uncomfortable reality for many, that oil and gas remain central to global energy systems and are key to energy security, at least in the near and midterm. So the question I have is, has the war breathed new life into fossil fuels? And what's the future of the net zero transition in the wake of the war in Ukraine? Are we at a point of detour, a point of derailment, or a different path? So Amanda Nevitt, I'll pose that to you and then pivot to Kevin. Great, thank you. It's, it's a really important question. And on the specifics of detour, derailment, or different path, I think I'd offer that depends on the timescale because right now I think we're in a detour in the short term 
and I think potentially for a fundamental different path in the long term. But that hinges on a bunch of questions that we still don't know the answers to. If I can just say a, a word about where we were before the invasion, um, the Europe uh, really over relied upon Russian oil and natural gas, despite Russians invasion of Crimea, Eastern Ukraine, Georgia 2008. And, and, and Germany in particular made a decision in 2011 after Fukushima to prematurely end their nuclear power plants instead of relying upon Russian oil and gas, betting on Russian geopolitical stability um, as a bridge to a renewable future. I think it's safe to say that that bridge has collapsed. <laughs> and what we're seeing right now is effectively, to borrow a Navy analogy, uh, turning an aircraft carrier of energy policy, but you can't turn that aircraft carrier on, on a dime. And so what we're seeing is that Europe is, made, is making a detour away from Russian energy. Obviously, U.S. gets much, much less energy from Russia. That's ended after the Biden declaration of an energy emergency and sanctions against Russia. And so we're seeing a detour and a fundamental rethink, uh, particularly in European energy policy. Uh, one example of that is Brussels' recent decision to allow nat natural gas and nuclear energy to be available for uh, green energy funding and investment. And obviously, Gazprom, too, we can talk about that. Kevin's obviously an expert on that, has now been canceled. So these are sort of a fundamentally rethinking. Uh, we're seeing this detour in real time, the shifting of the aircraft carrier in, in real time. And what I just mentioned with you with Gazprom, too, being canceled, natural gas, nuclear energy. Uh, this has been unthinkable six months ago. So we're seeing a fundamental, uh, I think, detour. I, I think it could be a different path long-term, Patrick, but that's contingent upon two questions. The first is, how is this war in Ukraine going to inf affect international climate negotiations, if at all? So we're, we're about four months or so away from COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, has been getting a lot of press, but clearly what's happening on the outside with Ukraine and energy instability will be impacting, I think, climate negotiations in, in Egypt. I think it's a very important conference of parties that uh, we'll be looking to. And then the second question I have, does this energy detour mark a fundamental shift in broader geopolitical alliances? We're seeing Russian oil and gas finding new markets, Global South, China, India, is the energy alliance going to impact broader geopolitical alliances, particularly, in, and I'm looking at India and China, uh, and that's all this, this complex stew of climate change and energy, I think will come to a head uh, uh, in due course. So those are my initial thoughts on that. Short-term detour, long-term, maybe a fundamental, uh, a fundamental uh, different path. Great, thanks. But to your point, it takes a long time to turn a very big ship, and this ship is indeed quite large. Kevin, what are your thoughts? Uh, good morning, Patrick. Uh, unlike Commander Nevitt, I'm not qualified to make naval analogies, uh, but uh, I, I agree with a lot of what he said. And I would say that uh, where we are is, first of all, as a signpost of transition, we're falling back on fossil fuels. The spare capacity in the world for energy that we need is not yet available through clean and renewable sources. And so if you want to know where we are, uh, the 80% statistic is, you know, the, the one that you see quoted so often, four out of five BTUs come from the ground. Uh, but it, it's more a question that 100% of the incremental ones are coming from the ground right now, uh, that I think is pretty, pretty obviously going to be a, a reminder of how hard it's going to be to get from here to there. Uh, and on that, I think there's two realities that have been exposed. Uh, the first is that a lot of the greening in Europe was predicated on the continued delivery of Russian gas. Uh, and so the expectation for that gas uh, is no longer a good one at all. This week, I think we'll find that the Nord Stream 1 pipeline either will or will not come back online. Uh, I, we're very skeptical at Clearview. We have been for some time that it would come back online in full strength. It's already been prorated by 60%. Uh, that's a major supply artery to Europe. And uh, I think, again, it's a scramble for molecules right now because the electrons of the future aren't here. The second is that I, we're seeing this in the US, that the green agenda, uh, and this, this has been elsewhere visible, was predicated on, in part, the expectation for affordability. And so one of the biggest threats to transition is the public acceptance of the plan. And it's harder to accept any plan when energy prices are high. 
So uh, it turns out that there's a rethink that has to happen there too. Now, the easy way to do things is to simply throw money at it, but the magic money machine has run into an inflation challenge for now. Uh, and so uh, the, the hard choices lie ahead. Let me just lay that out for you in numbers. Oil, gas, and coal exports from Russia, which were all targeted by the G7 months ago, comprise about five and a quarter percent of 2021 consumption of the energy the world uses. So if you ask, where are we now? Our estimate's about seven tenths of 1% of the world, the, the, energy, the, the energy the world uses is missing or soon will be with the coal embargo, especially in Europe. And what does that mean? What that means is that 100% of the world is either gonna do with three quarters of a percent less or three quarters of a percent of the world is gonna do with 100% less. And where you fall in that continuum has a lot to do with economic circumstance. And so what you're going to find is that folks are getting priced out of markets within and across nations because of the, the shortage we're moving into. And if the West truly proceeds with a plan to degrade Russia as an energy producer, which is the stated goal as of March of our sanctions regime, then we can expect the shortage to get tighter and the choice is harder. Thank you, Kevin. Let's, uh, let's dive a bit deeper on uh, Europe's energy security challenges. You both alluded to that. I think Germany's situation exemplifies a complex web of uh, climate, energy security, as well as foreign policy concerns. You know, the German government, while focusing on renewables, abandoned nuclear power and moved to increase uh, an already unhealthy dependence on Russian natural gas before the invasion. And thus, now it's forcing to talk about restarting old coal plants and a belated commitment to liquefied natural gas import terminal construction. Now, my fear when I look at Europe which is going through a really challenging heat wave at the moment. It's not so much the summer heat, but the winter cold. And when I look forward and look at the foreign policy considerations of this, as well as the energy security considerations of this, I see a potential point of fracture with our alliance and alliance cohesion in the face of Russia's aggression in Ukraine. And I think, I think Vladimir Putin sees that too. So I'm wondering, Commander Nevin, I'll toss that to you first. Just your, your thoughts on broadly the energy security challenges in Europe and then this potential point of fracture as we get into colder winter and fall and winter months uh, that this could be divisive in, uh, in the face of the continued Russian aggression in Ukraine. Right. So I'll, I think that you're correct and there's a real risk of um, sort of an energy alliance uh, fracturing and, and Russia is, is looking at that closely. I also think on my most optimistic days is that Vladimir Putin has been wonderful for the NATO alliance and uh, just broader tightening of the United States and our European allies, which we've had an historical uh, alliance since the end of the Second World War. And frankly, that was very much uh, up in question. A lot of qu uncomfortable questions are being asked just a couple of years ago on the Trump administration with the viability of, of NATO. And so on the, on, I'll just speak brief on the geopolitical piece. I think Vladimir Putin has been uh, a gift to NATO, the, the, the doubling of the Russian land border with uh, NATO allies, now Finland, now Sweden. This again, this has been unthinkable when I was working with NATO that they would quickly come around and be a part of, of the military alliance. Now, how does, how does the military alliance, how does the diplomatic alliance impact sort of just energy realities? I think that's just an open question that remains to be seen. Uh, prior to the Ukraine invasion, the European had the Green New Deal, which was looking to be operationalized and prices were all very, very much very high on, um, on, on European energy. I think it does showcase, frankly, just the danger of the reliance upon petrostates such as, such as Russia. You know, I think that the, that the response from the West to the Russia invasion of Ukraine has been strong despite the energy reliance of European economies to Russian oil and natural gas. I think that it could have been even stronger. It's hard to, hard to say exactly what that would mean exactly if in fact Europe, Europe had done the hard work five to 10 years ago of removing itself from, from Russian oil, gas, energy reliance. But I agree with you, Patrick. I don't have a great answer. I'm curious what Kevin has to say about the winter um, because that's when it's really going to be even more stressful. Yes, Kevin, as you're looking forward, what do you, you know, what's your prognostication? 
Well, it's, uh, I mentioned that doing less, uh, you know, however many percent less uh, based on where you fall in the economic continuum. Uh, Europe, Europe is uh, in a tough spot. So they've got about a hundred, a little over a hundred BCM of storage in the continent of gas. And they're over a little bit over 60 BCM stored right now. Uh, the expectation was to get, you know, as close to 80 or 90% uh, by the onset of winter as possible. And the rush to get gas in storage has been uh, pretty successful up until now, but this throws a big wrench in it. Uh, Putin has every incentive to use his leverage where he can, always with plausibly deniable reasons. Uh, you know, a missing turbine for the compressor station at Portavaya uh, on the Nord Stream 1 pipeline, uh, these kinds of things. But uh, he's using that leverage now. And the questions in March, we had two questions. One was, you know, would China be uh, Russia's buyer of last resort here too? Uh, and the second was, what would happen to cohesion inside the European uh, continent when shortage arrived? And, you know, part of the problem is that high prices do have a, a, a way of encouraging new technologies, but they tend to usher out elected officials before they bring in new technologies. And so you can see already uh, the, the loss of the French parliament uh, to Macron. Uh, I think there's some idiosyncratic reasons we can describe to Johnson's resignation in the UK, but nonetheless, high energy prices were a backdrop to that. Draghi in Italy, probably the third domino. Uh, and in that context, what leader wants to be short energy? Uh, you don't want to necessarily be short energy providing it to your neighbor either. And so when we get down to this point of shortage, we have real questions about how it's going to be apportioned, again, within and across countries. And so which industries will be the, the ones that get the energy that they need, the gas that they need to run heavy industry, especially in Germany, uh, and uh, which countries may find that the other end of the pipe isn't Cindy. Uh, so uh, Putin knows this. Uh, he's betting that the freely elected leaders of Western democracies will blink before Western sanctions pinch him hard enough to make him stop. Patrick, I think you're on mute. We've been doing this for long enough. You'd think that I would uh, have it instinctive to unmute myself when I start to start to talk. Um, I do want to pivot to the United States and how the United States has addressed energy security. Mark, you've written about this in a piece for, I believe it was for Just Security uh, last month, or maybe it was in May, but um, you, you've unpacked uh, the president invoking the Defense Production Act to bolster US investment in clean technology. Uh, you know, the president declaring that clean energy economy is essential for US national security. So just broadly to you, how has the United States addressed this energy security challenge? Sure, so uh, big picture, obviously the US is a net uh, exporter producer of energy. Our situation has changed dramatically from in the last 10 years, driven in part obviously by, by the shale revolution. So the US compared to uh, European allies is in just a much, much healthier position vis-a-vis -vis just our, our own natural resources that are that are, may or may not be open for extraction. Um, I think on the energy security piece, uh, going back to 2014 um, under Obama, uh, the administration has used its emergency powers to uh, sanction Russia, uh, banning the complete importation of Russian oil and coal into the United States in March, and then used the authorities to prohibit any new investment in the Russian Federation uh, in April. And so that's been weaning away from Russian oil and natural gas via domestic executive level emergency authorities. Obviously, that, that's a problem because the U.S. still gets some, <laughs> some uh, amount of energy from Russia. Um, the Biden administration has turned to using the Defense Production Act, which I think didn't get the, the amount of press it deserved, uh, to accelerate the renewable energy transition. Uh, the Biden administration determined that mining for critical battery materials is, quote, essential to the national defense, uh, relying upon sort of an old Cold War statute to underwrite clean energy development. Now, it remains to be seen is that really going to spur to some, some sort of green energy innovation? Not maybe not necessarily doing all the work that the Biden administration wants it to do, but it's certainly a commitment to using the authorities to accelerate the renewable energy. 
Um, just last month, um, there's been so much action on this. Uh, the Biden declared another emergency with respect to the threats to the availability of sufficient electricity uh, generation and stopping the importation of duties on solar cells of certain modules from, from, from five uh, nations in, in Asia. I, I think that they could be do, doing more. And right now there's discussion uh, driven, I think, largely by a, a Supreme Court decision, uh, the failure of uh, climate change, domestic legislation, and, uh, and the mansion discussions to look at more holistically, how are we going to look at energy security and, and climate security? Um, I can talk about that a little bit more potentially later, but we're seeing sort of small actions, I think, um, but a lot of different, different actions. One other example is uh, continuing a nuclear power plants in California, um, keeping them online. Uh, so we're seeing a bunch of different actions. I, I'm not sure if it's going to be cumulative, have the desired effect, but no shortage of ideas and, and, and executive actions taking place. I do want to, um, you mentioned just last week's announcement with Senator Manchin when he said he was not going to support uh, economic package this month. I think that's important to note that contains new spending for for climate and new tax increases targeting wealthy individuals and corporations. Obviously, that's a setback for the climate ad agenda, but I do think it's important to note that he also said uh, on West Virginia radio that he could support climate spending and tax increases, but only if economic indicators improve in, in the near term. So I think that that's, that's important contextually. But the question I wanna to pose to both of you is some senators have now called on the president to declare a national emergency on on climate so just do you think that that would be uh would be appropriate would you advocate for declaring a national emergency on the climate kevin i'll toss that to you first and then welcome mark's comments thanks patrick uh, we're analysts at clearview not advocates so i don't take Fair enough. we've been writing about this since 2019. uh there's a prototype the emergency at the southern border that the trump administration declared uh it there's questions of legality can you declare a climate emergency and the answer is, well, you can do it. And if you get sued, you can try again. The Trump prototype is you keep going until you get it, whether it's the immigration ban at the southern border. Uh, that's how things work. And uh, they can. So uh, in terms of emergency powers, you know, Commander Neves is absolutely right. Uh, there have been several invocations of emergency powers, very substantial interventions. Frankly, we're seeing a whole change to energy markets and capital formation uh, throughout the West, uh, much more suspicion and intervention. Uh, much less uh, of the, what we used to see uh, in terms of letting markets go to premia and, uh, and scarcity being solved by the price. Uh, there are some limitations to what you can do before you get to this sort of maximal emergency declaration. Uh, but if you, we actually go there, a climate emergency unlocks powers in several statutes. So right away, the ability to move things under the Organic uh, Transportation Security Act, uh, which includes pipelines, uh, moves energy, you know, the, the movement of energy goes to presidential control under this emergency power. Same with offshore drilling uh, operations on federal lands are already highly uh, subject to, to presidential and interior secretarial control. But this really ramps us up and includes the power to, to limit or license exports of crude oil uh, also uh, under an emergency under the 2015 liberalization of exports. There's dozens of derivative powers. Uh, the Defense Production Act is something of a of a blunt object. Uh, it, it is very good for defense logistics and procurement. Uh, the fact that we're using it for baby formula and solar panels uh, is not entirely what it was intended for. You still have to get a lot of installations for factories and deployment through environmental permitting and the DPA won't get you through that. But some of the emergency authorities and environmental statutes are available in a climate emergency. So it's a very broad tool. The question I think, Patrick, and, and this is one we'll have to ask is, is deploying this tool, which could limit hydrocarbon production and, and delivery to markets, the right thing to do right now when prices are high? Uh, it's clear the president wants to assert that he can bring this agenda to the voters that elected him uh, and to the world that he's promised to green. But it's not clear that this would be timed, ideally, for the markets where we are today. That's certainly a high level political decision that needs to be made. Mark, what are your thoughts? Sure, and I've, this might be a, a separate discussion. I've written extensively on climate change and, and emergency powers. And I think that politically, President Biden has had some setbacks with uh, the West Virginia versus the EPA Supreme Court case, 
which essentially puts domestic uh, regulation on their existing authorities under the EPA and the Clean Air Act. That it puts that the Clean Power Plan on, on ice for the foreseeable future. Um, obviously, that sort of the breakdown. You're correct, Patrick, about the nuances of Built Back Better, and, and now people talk about Built Back Mansion, but that. Um, the prognosis for that is, is highly uncertain and, and it was, there was a setback on Friday. It's important to note, I think, that we are in a state of 35 emergencies today. And one could argue, is that wise use of uh, a governance authority, governance power? I'll leave that to the, the political scientists and historians to say, to say that, and Kevin's correct, um, President Trump's invocation of a national emergency at the Southern border uh, really was, I think, a, an abuse of, of that power, um, predominantly because the statutes that he was relying upon pursuant to the National Emergency Declaration were uh, military construction statutes, which were not designed to put the border wall in place. For climate emergency, there is some real substantive incremental work that can be done, predominantly via the Defense Production Act, increasing lending limits, predominantly through the International Economic uh, Emergency Protective Act, IEPA, which could stop some really um, uh, harmful climate uh, trade or climate uh, chemicals uh, and, and greenhouse gases. Uh, but I think there's a risk of a backlash to, to this as well that has to be weighed. It's a very much a ultimately a political, political decision, but there are real authorities that are there uh, that could be used uh, but it's more addressed climate, not necessarily this energy discussion we're having with Russia, Ukraine. Great, thanks. Uh, the, the president was just in the Middle East. Uh, high gas prices in the US and global energy security disruptions from Russian war in Ukraine were widely seen as uh, primary motivators uh, for the trip to Saudi. Um, the president emerged from his meetings in Saudi Arabia without an immediate deliverable on oil production, but he expressed optimism that oil producing nations would take steps to, uh, to boost global supply in the coming months. Now, many are eyeing the August meeting of uh, the OPEC plus group, um, saying that a major announcement would likely stem from that meeting. So Kevin, since you keenly watch geopolitical developments as well as as well as Marcus, what do you what do you think might come out of next month's OPEC plus uh, plus meeting? Patrick, I think we should ask why did we get nothing from the kingdom? Uh, that's, probably that's both sides wanted it. As well. I mean, it's, it's reasonable to ask. You know, if, if you could have gotten something and you can get it in three weeks, why not today? Uh, and for the president, uh, the optics of it probably would have been messy uh, to explain to constituencies critical of the trip that it was being made for oil. Uh, by showing that oil was delivered upon arrival uh, would be <laughs> a lot harder than saying it's not for oil, even though everyone really thinks that it was. Uh, so the Saudis as well probably want to keep good ties with Russia and moving unilaterally outside the context of OPEC plus isn't a good way to do that. Uh, in terms of what comes next, you know, the OPEC plus bargain is essentially back to parity from where we were pre-pandemic but production isn't. So there's significant headroom, two and three quarters million barrels per day or so below the, the targeted level of production. And a headline increase does not necessarily an increase bring. Mm. So uh, it's possible to put numbers up without actually delivering nearly as much. The Saudis have strong incentives to deliver something. I think after the renewed security alliances that were discussed over the weekend, uh, it would be a slap in the face of Washington to do nothing. Uh, but it's also possible to do something with Russia at the table uh, that looks reasonably good on paper and doesn't bring much supply to market. Perhaps the, the biggest part of this whole thing is how much spare capacity actually remains. Uh, the, the question isn't one I can answer. No, no one's giving me the secret number, just so you know. I'm not hiding it from you. Uh, but the, the incentive is probably to make a small move rather than a big one. Uh, they can make a small move uh, and leave the world wondering how much spare capacity is there rather than making a big one and eliminating any doubt. Uh, and so the, uh, the, the likelihood is that we'll see a small move, probably not a big one. Mark, do you have any thoughts as we look to uh, the OPEC plus meetings next month? I would just offer, I agree with Kevin about the uh, meeting with uh, Saudi Arabia. Why do we 
get nothing essentially from that. It's unclear to me the the, the clear uh, do outs from that or clear um, commitments we get from from the kingdom. And I would just offer on OPEC. I don't have um, I don't have a crystal ball on on the August meeting. I just when I look at the broader topic of energy security for, in the 1970s, you know, obviously, obviously OPEC shocks in, in, in the early 70s um, related to Middle East instability. I think what is different today when we're talking about any sort of OPEC conversation is the 1970s, the energy security issues we're looking were largely through an economic lens. Mm -hmm. And now with broader decarbonization efforts, um, we, there's, there's an acknowledgement that we need, need to wean ourselves from fossil fuels. This is not just an economic issue, it's an environmental issue, it's a national security issue. Climate is tied up in all of this. And so I think bro broadly speaking, I think there's more of a uh, desire to wean ourselves away from fossil fuels in the long term and how will that impact these sort of short-term realities. Great, thanks. In terms of alternatives to, to fossil fuel, I wanna get your, your thoughts on nuclear energy. Uh, our energy and climate crisis, I think, forces us to really reconsider the role of nuclear energy. The IEA came out with a report this week that highlights nuclear is critical to clean and secure energy. So your thoughts, just uh, nuclear is part of the solution, but there's a Russia component here as well. And the American Security Project just this week put out a briefing note looking at Russian nuclear in industry dominance and American vulnerability. And one of the things that we cite is that in 2020, Russia was responsible for 40% of the global uranium conversion. And in 2018, it was responsible for nearly 50% of global uranium enrichment. So there's a vulnerability there in terms of nuclear fuel supply. And there haven't been sanctions placed on nuclear fuel coming out of, Was uh, coming out of Russia to date, I think, for this exact reason. So Kevin, I'll toss that to you first. And then, you know, Mark, I welcome your comments. Yeah, Patrick, it was telling, uh, we put tariffs on a number of, of Russian goods, uh, everything we hadn't already banned, basically, that we imported, but uranium was off the list. Uh, there were other ores and metals that were on the list, uh, but when the list came out, if you read through the HTS numbers, no uranium. Uh, and uh, I think that speaks to the essential question of where we would get more. The problem isn't just if the, I mean, if the U.S., the fueling cycle for, for nuclear power plants is 18 to 24 months, we've got a year of inventory, so there's some, some breathing room, but there's not really, because bringing mines on stream isn't an 18 to 20 more, 24 month process. It's two to three years, best case, for mothballed mines and, and longer still. Uh, neighboring nations, Canada, uh, being the best obvious supply of where we get more uranium, if not from Russia, is also going to be the supplier to other countries if other countries do this too. So uh, there's a real question of the, the contention that this would uh, create for uranium from friendly sources. And French shoring uranium while we try to get our own mining up to speed uh, is not necessarily a cut and dry case. It's obviously the first, first choice we'd make. Uh, as far as the, the nuclear plants themselves, you know, I think that the broader question is coming into focus now. It's clear that renewables by themselves uh, are a supplement more than a substitute right now without effective low cost storage. And the question is what will provide the baseload? And there's two theories of the case. One theory of the case is it's natural gas in place of coal, uh, and that balances well. Uh, but there's climate questions as well as now supply questions about gas. And so the second theory of the case is SMRs are the, the next wave in delivering something that is both clean uh, and also uh, essentially capable of balancing renewables in the grid of the future. And uh, of course, that, that's not a tomorrow thing either, uh, you know, a 10 to 15 year lead time on that front. So the answer could be both. Mark, what are your thoughts? I agree. I think that nuclear has several additional benefits that are just of renewed importance outside the energy security uh, context. It's important to note that nuclear power remains the only carbon-free energy source that can be operated on sovereign soil 24 hours a day. And it, I think it allows countries to increase their energy resilience while making strides towards the Paris Climate Agreement's goals. And I think study after study is a study just by the MIT looked at a thousand different scenarios for the US and other nations to achieve net zero emissions uh, domestically and, and nuclear offers by far the most affordable path to achieve that goal. Of course, ramping up nuclear power, nuclear energy, nuclear plants is a just a biblical amount of uh, resources, time 
expense reg regulations. We're talking years and years and years. Um, so I think we're having a little bit of a of a rethink of this. Kevin's an expert on this, I think, more, more than I am, much like we did in the 1970s when nuclear sort of had its moment in the 1970s as um, a way to be more energy uh, re resilient. But I think it's, it's a much more challenging problem uh, today. So those, just to drill down deeper, and uh, those challenges notwithstanding, I think today's changed policy landscape does um, pave opportunities for a real nuclear comeback. So I know that uh, asking you to peer into your crystal balls is not really that fair, but I'm gonna ask you to peer into your crystal balls and ask whether the whether we're at the dawn of a new nuclear age or some of these really public relations issues when it comes to nuclear power, as well as, as, well as getting, um, getting reactors online will stand in the way and we'll still be looking at oil and gas as the primary uh, primary sources of energy going forward while we wait for renewables to really scale as they need to. So Kevin, gaze into your crystal ball for me. <laughs> well, my crystal ball doesn't have the 15 year horizons it needs for the, the definitive answer. We're more of a, an 18 to 36 month company. But uh, in terms of what we see in the US today, uh, the preservation of the existing fleet has taken great prominence. Uh, the administration has fully backed it uh, if there is a, a build back mansion, as the commander put it, uh, we might get a uh, we might get a credit on top of the credit that came from the Department of Energy. Uh, so uh, the the long run, uh, though, depends on not just keeping those plants online, but deploying this whole new set of technologies. And uh, there's there's questions on the waste disposal here in the United States that have gone unresolved uh, that currently uh, do not necessarily stand in the way, but they loom. Uh, and in Europe, because there's a world bigger than the US, we have two very different pictures of, of how things can look. Germany, a country with an absolute incentive to keep nuclear plants online for all of the reasons you named, uh, is sticking with the plan to shut them down. And France, uh, with the biggest nuclear generation portfolio as a percentage of energy in the world, is decided not only to double down, but to nationalize its electric provider, its nuclear electric provider, uh, to that end. So. Uh, it's not yet clear that there's uniform buy-in. There's still a lot of concern uh, in environmental constituencies that has gone unresolved. The Diablo Canyon life extension uh, moment right now in California is a good test of that. There's, there's a clear energy case to be made, but there's still continuing environmental opposition. Mark also asking you to peer into your crystal ball. Um, you know, please. I'm pairing right now, and what's what's amazing to me is we're having this discussion about nuclear in, 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 a, in a meaningful way, uh, which I think we wouldn't be having this a, a year or so from now. The fact that Brussels, the EU, has now uh, provided the imprimatur of nuclear being a green technology, I think, is is significant. The Apple Canyon is is significant. I think the reality is within the United. It depends on where. It depends on where these plants will be built. There will be significant. I think political pushback um, based upon nimbyism associated with uh, nuclear waste issues, based upon just exist. We haven't built a nuclear power plant in this country in, in decades. And so how does that look based upon existing state environmental regulations? How does that look based upon the National Environmental Policy Act? I think for, for Europe, it's going to be, I think, a little bit potentially easier and frankly, a little bit more um, necessary than this country, which has... Um, you know, it's, it's a more energy, energy secure. So I don't have a crystal ball, but I think we're seeing some fundamental rethinking of this question of, of nuclear, nuclear energy. And I, I will say that from the Navy's perspective, if I can just say this, the Navy has operated nuclear submarines, nuclear aircraft carriers worldwide, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, since, since the 1950s incident free. It's a, it's a remarkable testament. So these are mobile <laughs> nuclear reactors, obviously different than nuclear power plants, of course, but it does, I think, showcase uh, a test case that it can be done. It can be done under seas. It can be done uh, in an operational type environment in austere conditions. And so we just need to be real about the risks of climate change, the risks of energy security, and the risks of, of a nuclear reactive meltdown. I mean, Fukushima, my understanding, I, I don't know that the deaths from Fukushima, I think it was maybe even zero from, from the nuclear incident in 2011. How many people are dying from lack of clean air from fossil fuels? At hundreds of thousands, right? So just we need to be really, 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 um, I think, challenging all assumptions here and taking a look at what the real risk is. 
That's a great point. And a number of senior leaders at the American Security Project who have spent time in, in uniform have made that exact exact same point that the Navy has been operating nuclear reactors for the 50s with significant incidents. So look at the track record, really. Uh, I want to pivot a bit. Uh, and Kevin, I'll toss this one to you first, talking about corporate strategies. So energy companies are generating record, record cash flows this year. So I guess the question that's also been posed by a member of, of the audience is uh, some private sector have seemed uninterested in driving investment into oil and gas production. So they're wondering what's the private sector looking for in terms of market signals before it puts money into the ground? It's a very timely question, right? So the issues that are coming up are twofold. The first is where are we gonna get our energy from when we have it all here? Why are we not getting more of it from here? And, and second, what does it mean for the investment in that energy uh, if you put it in now and it's stranded or in some way impaired later? Uh, and uh, they're uh, in pretty obvious tension with one another. You know, 80% of the supply growth in the 20 teens for global liquids came from US production growth. Uh, so we supplied through our shale a lot of energy security, buffered price in a way that made it possible to start thinking big about climate and to stop worrying about energy security, maybe to our detriment. Uh, but the, the problem was that it wasn't that profitable for the investments. Uh, and if you really wanna run a company, you are running a company for profit in the way we deliver energy in our sector today. And uh, that just wasn't gonna keep working. The, the people who were putting money in weren't getting any out. So the current environment is one where capital discipline is, is being reviled by the people who want lower prices and, and the way it was. Uh, but what we really want is we want energy supply that we can rely on, which means that it has to be profitably produced. Now, subject to a couple of things, uh, the signals you mentioned also include government signals. And this is where some of the, the, the current context is detrimental. It's the, the big interventions we're seeing, while extremely politically popular, are also disruptive to investments. And this will be true for any kind of energy at any point in, in time. When you see new government intervention, uh, that can undercut profits at whatever point. It may be in the public interest to do so, but it can crowd out investment later. The propping up or nationalization of companies that can compete with private companies that can't source capital as readily or perform unprofitably as long can push them out of the market. Price caps can make it impossible to recover your investment uh, and push companies out of the market. And so the, the risks now of actually pushing investment away are growing at precisely the time the, the organic case for that investment is materializing. And so that there is some growth, a lot more investment is going into to oil in the United States than had been in previous years, uh, but not necessarily as much as we saw in the 20 teens. And the two reasons are what I gave you. The, they need to be profitable and they're wary of, of being crowded out or pushed out by intervention. That actually weaves in quite nicely to a question posed by my old friend, uh, from Capitol Hill, Joel Starr, on whether you would advise the Biden administration to recalibrate its oil and gas policies to encourage renewed production, particularly for export to Europe. Kevin, what I'm hearing here is there's some uh, some second and third order effects that could end up pushing investment away if they did that. Well, recalibrating to encourage investment to Europe might not push away investment. Actually, one of the one of the upsides of exports is that it creates a market that keeps supply flowing inside the United States. But it's not as simple as just saying, yes, we love this. This is great. We're helping allies. Uh, to get gas to the coast, you need to build infrastructure in the middle. Uh, and so this is not necessarily an easy thing uh, or one that the country has been particularly good at. Look, another thing we can do is we can build a lot of renewable energy and cut our, our use of gas so we can push more gas out. But to do that, we also need to have grids in place to move that renewable energy to demand centers and pipelines to move the gas to the coast. So uh, I think it, recalibrating it really depends on what you mean. Saying yes to LNG, there's never been a moment in time uh, when we've been more motivated as a matter of security for our allies to say yes. But doing it means saying yes to more than just the terminals themselves. We've only got uh, about a minute left and we always try and end on time here at ASP. Uh, and I kind of want to come back to where I started. Um, in the run-up to COP in Glasgow, there was a lot of attention on what commitments were going to be made. And now in the run-up to COP in Egypt, uh, the conversation has shifted. So I'm wondering if, you know, has this made, in light of our current energy crisis, has this made 
the climate change story, last year's story. So Mark, I'll toss that to you first, then I'll allow Kevin to have the final word. So I've, I've argued actually, this is, if we, if we look closely enough, this could be an enormous opportunity. And I think in the long term, energy security is slowly converging with climate security due to the outsized influence enjoyed by Petro states. That was made clear in last fall's national intelligence estimate, which was, you can read it today, it really kind of showcased what we're going through now with over reliance upon Russia and other 20 or some odd Petro states for fossil, fossil fuel um, exports and over-reliance. Um, they are going to fear Russia, Saudi Arabia, other nations that rely, their economies rely, have an outsized reliance upon fossil fuels. They are going to resist broader decarbonization efforts, I think, full stop, because they're just, the incentives are lined up, their economies are intertwined with uh, fossil fuels in a way that makes, that, that they're just follow their, um, their, their geopolitical self-interest. I, I will say that on my more optimistic days, uh, this shift away, this realization of our energy security future and our over-reliance upon Russia and other petro states could in fact uh, decrease influence of Russia and other, other petro states. Uh, it could make, uh, do the hard work of making energies more uh, energy resilient and keep the Paris Climate Accord goals of 1.5 degrees Celsius alive. So accelerating this clean energy transition offers potentially a rare geopolitical win-win. On a more pessimistic, realistic days, I think to myself that a lot of these petro states and, and Russia, they'll find different markets. The hunger for energy is real. It's going to increase about 18 to 20 percent by, by 2040. The question is, where is it coming from? Will it go to the global south? Will it go to China? Will it go to, will it go to India? Regardless of where that happens, and I know we're ending time, we're, we're going to see, we're seeing a, a transformed sort of Europe 2.0 defined, I think, by this energy transition. So I'm curious what Kevin thinks. Well, I'll, I'll try to be brief then, because uh, I know we're at the edge here, and that's a pretty great way to end. So I'll just add this. There's never, uh, there's never a definitive moment in time when you can say a transition has occurred. But what you can look at are the, the foreseen events that make it happen faster. And the the national security case for transition is now clear. Uh, endogenous electrification is a way of de-risking uh, the, the globally sourced petroleum at a variable cost level, right? You now don't have to worry about what happens in world markets because your fueling is happening from clean energy inside your borders. The problem with that thesis though, is that it now introduces a fixed cost risk, which is where you're going to get those transition minerals and metals. And for a lot of the Western countries we're talking about that are positioned to do exactly this and precisely now, they don't have an answer to that question yet. Uh, and so <laughs> I think you'll have to have another session, Patrick, for uh, perhaps uh, a discussion of that. Uh, but very good to be here with you today. No, that's, uh, that's great, Kevin. That's a huge issue for us to explore and in a future conversation. But that is all the time we have for this morning. To our guests on the line, thank you for joining. I hope you'll join us next week when we have a conversation with Ambassador Doug Lute on NATO's next act. We will review the strategic concept that came out of Madrid, threats to the alliance, new additions to the alliance, and alliance cohesion. Uh, but for now, that concludes today's conversation. Kevin, Mark, Thank you so, so very much for, uh, for a really just fantastic discussion. Thanks for having us. Thank you.